Welcome you back to the BAC workshop on 5G. My name is Jimmy Mifsud, the co-chair of the Planning and Future Trends Working Group. It is an honor for me to be moderating this interesting panel with whom we will be discussing the anticipated pace of innovation. Given the strategic importance of 5G for the European market, BEREC aims to pursue further work that should help NRA to anticipate the regulatory issues involved. Taking into account developments in the market, BEREC's work in this area is focused to support innovation through the implementation of proper steps, which are important to meet and boost the pace of, of technology. With us today, we have Dr. Wilcock, the chairman of the board of the 5G Infrastructure Association. The primary objective of the 5GIA is to promote and support European leadership for the development, deployment and evolution of 5G and ensuring a clear European voice on 5G around the world. Dr. Wilcock has vast experience in the telecommunications industry, having worked directly or indirectly with many of the major players. He is also active in the European research ecosystem and is currently the head of research alliances at Nokia. We also have the pleasure to discuss innovation with Dr. Siddiqui, who is a senior researcher at I2CAT Foundation, where he is also the area manager for Software Networks Research Lab. His current research topics include network automation, SDN and NFV based control, management and orchestration platforms for 5G, network slicing, and NFV SDN security. He is also project coordinator of 5G Zorro, which we will be discussing in more detail during this panel. Joining us today, we also have Prof. Bernardo Scano, an associate professor at the University Carlos III of Madrid. He coordinates the NFV course of the Master and Specialist in NFV and SDN. His research interests focus on 5G and beyond technology. Currently, he is the Vice President of 5Tonic Research and Innovation Laboratory. Prof. Bernardo is currently the project coordinator of 5 Growth Project, which will be looked further into during this, this panel. We are also pleased to welcome Dr. Hitze, who is the technical manager of 5G Croco, which is focusing on connected, cooperative and automated mobility services along different countries. He is also senior ex expert of the Business Innovation Digital Division and Connected Mobility at T-Systems International, working on OSS, BSS, platform integration, data analytics for automotive backends and 5G automotive. We also welcome with us Dr. Pagano, who will be providing insight on the Corealis project. He forms part of the Italian National Inter-University Consortium for Telecommunication, leading the Networks of Embedded Systems area at the National Laboratory of Photonic Networks and Technologies in Pisa. Dr. Pagano is the Director of the Joint Laboratory on Advanced Sensing and Networking in Seaports. His research activities have a specific focus on intelligent transport systems and port of the future. Last but not least, we welcome to this panel Mr. Avaro Neira, a principal consultant at Exxon Partners Group, an international strategy consultant with broad experience in the TMT and ICT sectors, advising at broad and sea level, mainly in Europe, Middle East and Latin America. In the field of 5G, Mr. Neira has provided advice on a wide range of strategic and regulatory topics to regulatory authorities, multilateral institutions and private players across multiple regions. His area of expertise include business planning, regulatory strategy and public policy development. And today we will have the opportunity to hear his views on 5G and innovation. Without further delay, I will start this panel discussion by turning to Dr. Wilcock. During the past years, industry and academics have come together to study first the technical aspects of 5G and subsequently the development of 5G vertical use cases. Describe the role that 5G Infrastructure Association has played in this aspect? Well, firstly, thank you for the question and uh, thank you for the invitation to this panel. I hope you can hear me okay. Well, that's a good start. So the 5G Infrastructure Association, as was mentioned, tries to be the voice of European industry on 5G and for 6G going forward. But one of the key things we try to do is also try to nurture the research on 5G, the leadership of 5G in Europe. And one of the key things we've been doing there is we've been responsible together with the European Commission for running the 5G PPP program. So this is a partnership program between the European Commission and industry, the industry represented by my own organization, the 5G Inter Infrastructure Association. It has invested somewhere around 700 million euros of public funding trying to bring that 5G leadership to Europe. 
How have we done that? We have had. <laughs> forgive me if I might have a few minutes more just to explain a little bit more about the question. So within this program, we had a first phase, which was 2014 for the first sort of three or four years where we tried to develop the fundamental technology of 5G. So quite often in the telecoms world, we do a very funny thing, which we make up a name for something like 5G or 6G or 4G, and then we decide what it's going to be. Now, someone needs to do fundamental research to actually work out what are the building blocks, what should be the key technologies, what are the concepts for that technology? And that's where this first set of projects within the 5G PPP partnership came um, to advantage. And there were many of the key concepts we currently take as 5G were developed there, fed into standardization in 3GBP. Then in the second phase, the key thing we, would do, we did was these verticals, which was actually in the question, thank you. And the key thing about the verticals is clearly, that's what differentiates hopefully 5G from the previous generations, that it's not just about teenagers and smartphones, it's about the ability to actually digitize these other industries beyond telecoms. And we've invested a lot of time and money, many trials, many projects to make sure that works and it, it really is something which is vital that we actually invest the time to bring the various different players together from the telecoms and from the other industries they can work together understand the technology develop the technology in the further further evolution of 5g and then really get results but we will talk more about that later thank you apologies for interrupting you previously <laughs> so BEC is seeking to anticipate the regulatory issues involved so that it can support the pace of innovation. What are the 5GIA's opinion on when should we expect the different 5G UK use cases to become mainstream? Yeah, this is a very difficult question. So as I said before, uh, one of our key goals with 5G is to go beyond the classical telecoms market. What we have done, as I say, we've had um, hundreds of trials, um, nearly 100 projects looking at verticals in the different industries, smart, um, smart cities, smart agriculture, industry 4.0, smart media. We will actually be hearing about a number of them today from the presentations later, which is great. Um, what we've seen is we've seen that the different sectors are very, at very much different time scales. They are very much different maturity. We have created white papers, which you can find on our website on 5GIA.eu, uh, where you can see where we've looked at where are these various different industries. Some, some are near market or actually deploying. So if you look at something like automotive, if you look at something like industry 4.0, those are fairly near the market. There are products being sold in those areas today. And the technology to fully support that is being developed by standardization now and will be available with release 17 and release 18. So those are mature, those are working, those are fine. But there are many, many industries where the story is just starting. Where they are just hearing about 5G and looking to the future, we will be starting a new partnership this year called Smart Networks and Services. I can hear someone typing, which it's very impressive from the typing speed, but maybe we don't all need to hear it. So if you could mute if you're not if you're not talking, please. Um, what I was trying to say is this new program that will be starting this year and going for the next eight years. This will also have a 5G component. And the reason it will have a 5G component is exactly this, that there are still many vertical industries we need to bring in to 5G technology. We need to make sure 5G, 5G technology is everything that we had in that vision to start with. So there's a lot of work still to be done there. So in general, that means that there are certain vertical technologies which are already deploying, already using that technology. And there are some where we can talk about the next five to 10 years before they will start using it seriously. How receptive are the vertical industries to the use of 5G dependent solution? Has there been an increase in interest? There's definitely been an increase in interest, uh, and I hope that we have played a role in that, having these collaboration projects. And, and, and what's good about this question is I can come back to what I didn't say before. The issue here, to be clear, is this world believe that if I need to work with a different industry, be that automotive or industry 4.0 or anything, 
All I need to do is I need to go there with my piece of paper and I need to say, well, please give me your requirements and we'll go away and do it and everything will be fine. But that's not how it works. A lot of these vertical industries are very large industries, often larger than telecoms. They have their own world, their own way of doing standardization, their own way of specifying things, their own language, if you will, of how uh, what they think is important in terms of KPIs or what they're looking in a technology. And fundamentally, telecommunications is not their core business. It's building cars or building factories. And, and that means that the there is a threshold for them to using 5g technology and that threshold is um trust that it is the technology they want to use and that's what these collaborative projects have allowed it's allowed in a low risk environment at a low cost for these um sectors to work together with the telecom to actually show to prove that this technology is the right technology for the future and more than that more than that, we've, we've actually been able to now develop the 5G technology to meet their future requirements. So uh, it, it, they are receptive. There is an increasing awareness of 5G technology. There is an increasing use of 5G technology, but there is still a long way to go. Do you anticipate any concerns from the public related to, for example, privacy or security issues? This is a very interesting, obviously a very topical question. Um, in, in, in the broad sense, I, I don't think 5G is, is probably a key source of uh, security or privacy concerns, shall we say. It's, it, it's more typically, at least in terms of the public, it's more typically in terms of the, the services that go on top of that, the internet services, the Facebook, the things like that, where at the moment, you know, it, it's Wild West out there, as we've all seen. And it certainly doesn't match the aspirations or values of Europe. Indeed, this is one of the key things we wish to make sure is corrected in 6G technology, that in 6G technology, we bake in those values of, 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 of personal data security and privacy into that technology, because I don't think anyone else in the world is going to do that. However, in the broader sense, if we if we don't think of public as in individual users, but we think of um, the actual broader use of 5G in these vertical domains, then of course security becomes a key aspect. And again, it's because of the youth case. If my teenage son is using his phone, playing a game, and suddenly the link goes down, he will complain to me, but the world is not at the end. But a lot of the services we're talking about for 5G going beyond telecoms are things like automated cars, um, controlling of factories. If those connection goes down, people will die. Then security has a very different meaning. Then it means the integrity of the system, uh, where the components come from, uh, redundancy. Then, of course, that becomes important. And as we go forward through time, and as we've just discussed, we're expecting more and more of these vertical industries to start using 5G to underpin their whole business model, their whole business process. Then it will become, in my view, one of these key um, infrastructures, national infrastructures that must be protected like water, like electricity. So in those terms, then security becomes a, a real issue. Thank you, Dr. Wilcock. I now turn to Dr. Siddiqui project coordinator of 5G Zorro. 5G Zorro is working on an architecture for future 5G networks in a secure and trusted manner. It will also use distributed AI to implement cognitive network orchestration and management with minimum manual intervention, that is zero touch automation, and DLTs are adopted to implement flexible and efficient distributed security. Bringing AI, DLTs and 5G together is an interesting prospect. Can you elaborate on the principal use cases being explored in 5G Zorro? Uh, hello, and first of all, thanks a lot for, for inviting me here. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, yes, so this, this the project 5G Zorro that, um, that we are working, um, a bunch of 13 partners together. Uh, like uh, like Colin just mentioned, you know, like in the in the early phases of the of the the five G PPP program, the, it was everyone was mainly working on the, the main building blocks of five G. But now this project specifically is like in the last phase, and we were looking in like you know what are the missing pieces of the puzzle, 
which will uh, you know help in the mass adoption of what we are suggesting. So one, we we narrowed down our focus on one thing, which is the, the promise of ubiquitous computing and connectivity of 5G. Now, how to facilitate that? Which mean like you know computing and connectivity everywhere. Now, one uh, provider or domain can cover everywhere. So what are the missing things over there? And we uh, uh, you know focused ourselves further down into automation and security, which you also you know asked in, in the, the previous uh, uh, presenter as well. Because these, I, I think, are the main impediments, you know, in moving towards or in, in, in realizing the, the dream of uh, ubiquitous computing of 5G. And now in order to, you know, move towards this automation, there are multiple concepts, zero touch automation, ultra automation, security or trust, you know. So, and also, like, like I said, in order to uh, realize this uh, connectivity of computing everywhere, we need, we have to cross the, the domains. We have to go, you know, across domains. Which means we fall in the problem of trust. Do we trust each other when we are leasing out resources or not? Hence, we went out and you know uh, also included like these disruptive technologies under the hood with 5G. Hence, the, the you know we came up with the integration of DLT blockchains and AI as they are part of the 5G system. So their integration at system level, you know, not as an, an external, but of course we are using them as our as tool to ourselves. So, you know, this is just to, you know, put in context and narrow down what this project is, is aiming at. The use cases are very interesting. Two of them are mainly more system or platform oriented from 5G point of view, and one is more application or vertical point of view. So I'll start with the first one, which is mainly on how to, uh, which is uh, smart contracts for uh, ubiquitous computing or connectivity. So again, here, what we're doing is like smart contract, which are anchored in DLT. You know, this is again to automate the process of if one domain is trying to lease out a resource from another domain, how, how can we automate this process? But before we even go there, 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 are, there are two things we had to do. So the innovation in this use case is related to the, first of all, the resource discovery, you know, the need and how do I discover if the resource is available? Because I, I, am, I have my eyes in my domain, but not in the other. So in order, so we, we we set up this again a DLT anchored five uh, G resource marketplace, and then also another innovation that we did is the smart discovery of it. So being having some requirements, how can I using AI and information from the monitoring, I can you know make suggestions for a particular domain that they can do this. So this is one uh, use case that we have that you can see. So smart contract on the top and AI you know and DLT you know under the hood to to achieve this uh, uh, transaction. A more specific case of the first one is the dynamic spectrum sharing, and this was this was a bit more challenging because here the resource that we are talking about is spectrum, which is you know uh, which has a lot of regulations and, and restrictions attached to it, and in this use case, so again the concept is the same that the spectrum resource is shared. Uh, you know, so we had to come up with the, you know this is something new. Uh, this topic is gaining uh, you know uh, uh, attention now. And how we can do th th this using the same concept I mentioned in, in the first use case, right? But here there were for, for some things we, we had to ensure that is, you know, like uh, uh, the, we came up with the idea of this spec token, which is like an indivisible, non fungible uh, uh, spectrum that one spectrum owner can lease out to another one for a particular time and space, you know? But then there are more things attached to it, how this could be. Uh, configured dynamically enforced spectrum could be monitored ensuring SLA management so all these things are attached to to, to this one and the third and the last one that uh, you mentioned is more the vertical is related to CDN and again the we are trying to verify the first two by having a vertical on board here right so the thing is like with CDN we know like it's very common now if the CDN have direct contacts with the cloud operators they have you know direct connection with them to enable their services but in this case, they, they have a very tied up connection, you know, like link with them. So if they are going to jump to another, uh, you know, cloud, they need to set up, a, you know, the, the whole thing again. So hence, you know, the smart contract and, and surety and, and security and trust build based on that will support this well, this one as well. And we are mainly, you know, focusing on the on the situations in CD and services where you have a flash mob or you, are, you have certain, you know, high picking uh, services. How do you maintain? how a new resource could be leased out 
automatically, you know, the smart contracts could be generated and in moving forward. So, in a very quick nutshell, you know, these are the three use cases the project is, you know, trying to uh, validate. The intersection of AI, DLTs, and 5G may position such an initiative as bleeding edge. When do you foresee market adoption of such solutions? Okay, <clears throat> well, mar market adoption, uh, uh, of course, I, in my opinion, as a researcher, I, I see uh, there's still a lot of time. I, I draw my, my opinion from looking at some other uh, you know, technologies that were there. But still, I have not seen like full adoption. For example, I give example of uh, SDN and NFV. When it started like uh, five, six years ago, it was like, you know, the, the candy everyone wanted. And uh, and I, I remember like in 2019, uh, attending the last SDN NFV Congress in Hague, the main topic was what went wrong. Even though telecom and everyone was eager to, you know, jump on to and use this technology. However, there were many technical impediments and policy impediments to be, to be sorted out. And we are yet to see, you know, a uh, mass adoption. So I'm, what I'm referring here is for ma mass adoption, right? So here, you know, in this case, we have 5G, AI, DLT. So we have like three, uh, you know, technologies. Uh, AI, DLT, I, I, I see like them as well, maturing, evolving. We don't have, you know, we have, you know, seen, there are some proof of concept, but, you know, there are still a lot of, uh, a lot of issues to iron out, especially related to governance in terms of DLT. If I may say, and also in terms of trustworthiness and AI, all these things will add to how soon the market will, you know, uh, adopt these. These, nevertheless, uh, being a researcher, this is for us, you know, like the research channels we have, we can prove, like you know, the the value they add. But yes, uh, like for five G, as you know, like we are, we have released sixteen now. Uh, we have the standalone here. We are expecting enhancements in the coming releases by twenty twenty three. We do see some services offered by operators, but we are yet to see the full blown potential of 5G yet. So I think there is still time. Uh, we are ahead of, uh, you know, the, the hence 5G and beyond the project that is trying to, to, to achieve. An essence application of AI and DLTs is that related to regulatory technologies, which streamline compliance and oversight. How can such initiatives secure the interest and participation of regulators at the onset? Okay. Well, in, in this one, uh, from from my point of view, what I see, like for example, that the technologies, uh, uh, the concept, the five G is putting in front of us, uh, like uh, infrastructure sharing is not new. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, one of the participants before Joma from Cellnex, he mentioned about neutral hosting. You know, in the previous uh, one. In fact, the the, the project five G City, uh, I took it was leading that and building the neutral host concept over there, right? But these infrastructure sharing and now adding automation on top of it and now adding security to it, adding marketplace, smart discoveries, all these points, you know, and this is now enabling and I was very, very pleased to see, you know, a lot of talk about private network, 5G private networks, but these requ will require a lot of, of some, some regulations, you know, and spectrum is also, also directly involved over here. And then the technology, like I mentioned, like DLT, which will require on the governance and this part. So from my side, I think it's very important that regulator, you know, they 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 will uh, hopefully see a clear interest to be part of the collaboration right from the beginning, you know, like uh, because if with the regulators they have the user interest and the healthy market competition at the you know core of their work, right? So I think. If they are involved in the early collaboration, this will really set the ground straight, you know, very well for the for for the future developments, in my opinion. What are your, your recommendations to Berk in terms of emerging trends and innovative concept? Sorry, concepts that will impact the telecommunications sector and rely on very high capacity networks, including 5G. Okay. Well, like, like I mentioned before, I think that, the, you know, I, I tried to part, part, partly answer this in the previous one. Uh, different challenges, you know, and we have in the underlying technologies related to governance, technical as well, uh, regulations and all. And now we are trying to converge them, putting them, you know, uh, 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 and using them in, in a seamless way. And this will be impacting the users in, you know, again, uh, I go back to my point, like, uh, since 5G and the so many uh, you know verticals we, we heard about 
cars and everything that the colleague was mentioning and other colleagues, they will be impacting user uh, daily life and the way they use technology, right? Hence, going back to the same thing, uh, regulators, I think, have to be part of the, the, the discussion or because they, they, again, to safeguard the user, and the, the competition, because I was quite uh, uh, happy to see a lot of questions related to, you know, they, and to me, I read them as if they're asking regulators to be, you know, uh, active in, you know, what the 5G and the private networks. So reading those comments and, uh, and I think kind, <clears throat> kind of reinfirmed my understanding that, you know, uh, especially Barrack from the Barrack point of view, you know, uh, the collaboration and involvement is key. Thank you. Now I turn to Prof. Bernardo Scano from Five Growth. The Five Growth project pursues the technical and business validation of 5G technologies from a vertical point of view, following a fee trial based approach on vertical sites. Five Growth is looking at three verticals Industry 4.0, transportation, specifically rail, and energy. Can you kindly provide more information on the objectives of Five Growth project, especially in relation to the approach adopted for the business validation? Hello, uh, I, think, I hope that you can hear me well. So, first of all, thanks for the invitation and, and for the attendance, the participants, and the speakers. So, regarding Five Growth, um, in terms of uh, main objectives, well, there are like um, I would say two sides of, of or two types of objectives for Five Growth. One is the, the validation of, of 5G technologies in general in, in this following this field trial based approach in three vertical sites, uh, following uh, basically one in Spain for Industry 4.0, one in Italy for uh, also Industry 4.0, and two in, in Portugal, but I, I call them one, but it's actually there are two in Portugal for uh, railway signaling and smart grid. And in addition to this uh, vertical, vali vertical validation of, of 5G technologies, we are also doing some innovations in the area of 5G as learned to be required by those 5G verticals. So those are the two main sides. And this validation in general of the overall 5G technology plus the innovations is done from a technology point of view and also from a business point of view. So regarding the business validation, which you also asked specifically about that, we have one dedicated work package and actually one task to do this thing. And basically what we have already done in one, uh, there is one deliverable already reporting on this, is to, to do a quantitative evaluation of the economic benefits provided by 5G technologies and the innovations that we brought by, by 5 Growth. This is in D1.2. For those that want to go into more details, there is this derivable is in our public uh, website. And basically, what we do this, what we do there is to analyze the distribution of the different costs among the different stakeholders, and uh, what are the savings that we get through the use of 5G for each of the vertical uh, sites. So the main methodology that we follow is basically we identify the different economic items per pilot. Then we estimate per pilot the operational savings, the capital savings, and the new revenues. Then we estimate the market share, and we calculate more or less the overall benefit per vertical. Then we go into the different stakeholders, and we distribute the benefits related to the pilot for, to the different stakeholders. So we have uh, identified which are the main stakeholders and how the money flows. And we calculate the total benefit per stakeholder, and, and now we are in the face of doing a more detailed business validation uh, approach that will be reported at the end of the of the project. Do you foresee that the lessons learned from this approach adopted for this project can be reused as new use cases come to fruition? Yeah, uh, this is one of the I would say key outcomes I think of of a project like Five Growth. Because when we talk, uh, I mean, the lesson learned for me is, is in any research project is probably the, the main outcome. So we, we are learning and we have learned a lot in Five Growth in the process of how to analyze, develop and validate vertical use cases on the premises and, and how to learn from that. But also due to the COVID-19 situation, we have also learned a lot on how to do this integration, validation, development in a much more remote 
this way. So we have learned on these two sides. So even though we are follow, we are basically focusing on nine use cases in these three pilots over these three, four sites in five growth, we, we are already applying the technology of five growth in other use cases. So we believe that all the learnings that we are doing in five growth or that we will obtain in five growth will, will be applicable to, to other use cases. Just to provide a few examples, five growth is integrated with other uh, ICT 17 projects, which are the ones in, in Europe doing the end-to-end -end, uh, 5G testing platforms. And we are integrated with 5G if and 5G Vini. And, and this have uh, allowed us to learn also a lot of how to emulate the integration of public and non-public networks in 5G. So this is one thing that we have learned and that we are developing even other use cases on, on top of this. Then we have also some collaboration with other projects like 5G Dive. And we are also uh, doing a lot of uh, trying to apply the innovations that we have in five growth in other use cases. And we are also leveraging of the tools that uh, Phytonic provides. Uh, Phytonic is a co-creation uh, and innovation laboratory that allows us to do a lot of uh, preliminary integration and learnings before going into the, into the actual vertical premises. A uh, question which we have similarly asked to the previous speakers related to the anticipated pace of innovation. So, Five Growth is looking at the use of machine-to-machine, -machine, IoT, augmented reality, and safety-critical communication. When do you foresee that such use cases can be mainstream? Well, as also, I think, uh, commented by previous speakers, for like example, Colin, uh, this is a very good question and not easy to, to answer at all. I think there are many, many players involved, as, as also Colin mentioned. This is a collaborative uh, effort uh, to really adopt 5G. And adopting 5G is not really like uh, uh, replacing a wire or a cable or replacing a, a cellular technology with another one. It's not taking 4G and putting 5G because if we want to, to take benefit of all the advantages of 5G, this requires a transformation in the in the, on the verticals and a learning curve also as well. We need to, the verticals need to learn how to make the best out of the advantages that 5G provides, the typical ones that we always talk about, ultra low uh, latency, high reliability, high bandwidth, massive uh, machine type communications, and of course, uh, high bandwidth. But there are a lot of, I mean, there are new things in 5G. 5G is a new paradigm that is not only a transport, it's an active, participant of, of the, the, in the, in the, in the process, in the application. So we need the verticals to learn. Uh, also the, 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 the stakeholders involved in the, in providing the 5G technology, the vendors, the operators, the researchers, we also need to learn how to provide that 5, the 5G technology to the verticals in the way they want, in the way they need, because sometimes, and we have learned that in, in 5 growth, we see okay, this 5G technology is going to solve this problem for this vertical, this for sure, this will blow their minds, but they have different things in mind. They have also different problems, different uh, ways to approach a problem, and we need to, to learn into, into this process. In any case, I think that uh, the next two years probably will be key in terms of looking into how to adopt uh, 5G in, into new use case, into by some of the verticals, and I think Industry 4.0 may be one of the, the, the families of verticals that probably will start uh, adopting part of 5G, maybe not the full-fledged 5G that we may be looking at into the, into the research project, but some type of, of, of 5G. So I think that's, that's a, a very good uh, example of use case that will, will show some deployment and some adoption in the near future. What are the key parameters in terms of quality of service that must be delivered by a 5G network in order to enable real-life real implementation of these use cases? Well, again, if we take the Industry 4.0 family of use cases, uh, what do we need there? For, for sure, we need uh, high reliability. Uh, this is a thing that has also been mentioned before. Now we are not talking about uh, as an end user suffering from a disconnection no, it's, it's real, real things, uh, not real. I mean, 
critical things, yes, safety related things. So we, we really need that. We also need the low latency. If we are talking about industrial processes or if we talk also about the vehicular uh, automo uh, autonomous driving, these kind of things, the low latency is, is key. If we look into, just to put another example of, of use cases, those that involve uh, augmented reality kind of things, that there are many, I mean, not only on the on the gaming, not only on the industry for the zero, where we are looking at very many examples of uh, gesture-based AR in, uh, immersive ways of, of managing the, the manufacturing uh, machinery. But also, for example, there are uh, some applications of uh, 5D for an AR for emergency response. We may have an emergency team getting into, a, into an emergency where something happened and using AR to get there and also to aid at how to tackle the, the emergency or how to address the emergency. So for those uh, AR-based scenarios, latency is key and also uh, the bandwidth is key. So for me, in my personal opinion, those are the, the, th the key things that we will need. But of course, there are many. Also, the machine, uh, machine, machine type communication will be key for, for some industrial environments. Uh, so yeah, basically the, the typical, the classical ones that we know 5G will provide are the key ones in order to ensure that uh, the use cases will be implemented and deployed and adopted in real life conditions. Thank you. Dr. Hetze, Technical Coordinator of 5G Croco. 5G Croco will trial 5G technologies in the cross-border corridor along France, Germany and Luxembourg. In addition, 5G Croco also aims at defining new business model that can be built on top of this unprecedented connectivity and service provisioning capacity. Ultimately, 5G Croco will impact relevant standardization bodies from the telco and automotive industries. Can you kindly elaborate further a description of the 5G Croco project and the three use cases which it is focusing on? We can't hear you. Sorry, then I, I will start again. Um, thank you for inviting the, the 5G Croco project. I have prepared some uh, slides for the, uh, to, to present the, the project as an um, activity from the European Commission together with two other big projects, uh, 5G Carmen and 5G Mobix, to uh, show how automotive uh, applications uh, will be used in environment of um, uh, 5G in, in cross-border scenarios. Um, sorry. Um, we have uh, three big um, use cases selected to show how these uh, use cases may um, validate it uh, for cross-border, cooperative, connected, and automotive mobility. And these use cases are teleoperated driving, uh, high-definition map generation, and uh, anticipated cooperative collision avoidance. All these use cases uh, will uh, be presented and piloted uh, in a cross-border environment with support of uh, mobile edge computing, uh, predictive quality of service um, solutions, and a an, uh, real end-to-end network slicing um, QoS security. The um, idea is to, uh, to use uh, two big uh, corridors, one from Germany, Luxembourg, and the other one from France, Germany, to show how such applications will really work in a pilot environment on, on real streets uh, with, with a network uh, in these two uh, or in these three countries. The, the idea behind is to um, uh, to use or to show uh, new 5G uh, capabilities um, in these uh, use cases. And here I have um, selected a few of them, but uh, already mentioned that the real um, big building block for us is to uh, ensure quality of service in this uh, cross-border environment with the help of uh, mobile edge computing, 
and of course um, to ensure this with new radio capabilities with uh, MNO handover and then real end-to-end uh, -end, uh, quality of service. For, for the use cases, we have already mentioned the teleoperated driving. Um, that means um, we have a control center where an um, operator with the so-called direct or indirect driving mode may be able to react on um, conditions where the autonomous driving function, function in the car is not able to deal with. So that um, you can imagine that it's uh, very important for cases where normally an um, operator has to drive to the car. So uh, the, the tailor operator may help from an, an tailor operation station to do this. And um, especially for such applications, we also are working uh, very uh, tough on the uh, idea to have a prediction on quality of service in the network to be sure that these functions really will work uh, for the requested time. The second use case is a high definition maps, generation and distribution, and to uh, generate a so-called uh, closed loop. It means um, one car here in this picture, car A, will see any whatever problems, changes on the road, or whatever, whatever, and uh, give this signal back to the back end, um, change uh, the dynamic map, and um, this changed map information will then be distributed to a next cars in, the, in our case here the, to the car B. And um, for our trials, we have or we can already show how important uh, such new functions like 5G or 5G um, mobile edge really will improve the network quality and uh, the service for the um, use case. Our last use case is uh, anticipated cooperative collision avoidance. And here uh, we are on a way to uh, combine different uh, fleets over a standard interface and, and uh, according uh, host implementation on mobile edge to um, be able to inform cars with extreme low latency according problems um, on the road and to prevent, uh, of course, collisions on, on this road. And here you can also see again how important um, new functions on mobile edge um, will be to um, improve the quality of uh, in this case, the, the, the latency, to reduce the latency for, for our applications. OK, thank you for this question. Do you think that uh, such uh, deployments, cross-border deployments, will rely on one net network? Yeah, the, the idea, of course, is to um, we are um, able to, uh, to to provide very high quality in, in insurance for for mobile operation for mobile operator networks. That means um, we think that uh, with mo uh, mobile network slicing, uh, we can target the so-called fail functionality, fun functional safety fun functions. And it means um, there are really good reasons to, uh, to, to, uh, to have these applications working in one network in one country. But of course, um, to uh, provide very high stability, especially in the uh, cross-border environments, our idea is to have more than one connection uh, possible to more than one mobile edge sender to um, overcome an, an, a lack of connectivity. It means, in, especially in the cross-border environment, we uh, have a so-called make-before-break uh, uh, idea to be sure that um, you have always in connection. And it means in this constellation, at least you need um, more than one network. Thank you. Um, what has 5G Croco unraveled in terms of business models? Yeah, business models, um, of course, in this new functions are quite complex. I have here um, one of the, one uh, example for teleoperation. And um, that means uh, for the uh, new business models, you have a new relation between new players and uh, you have also new uh, usage, uh, especially for such cases like uh, autonomous driving or tailor operation. Uh, you have then tailor operation control center, you have um, mobile edge providers and they 
may in future uh, have a total other um, business uh, ideas behind. For instance, you can take your service as subscription to different cars, or you can get a uh, um, build for uh, different um, driving kilometers, or you can get built for different areas. And all these new constellations, of course, are quite complex. Uh, and uh, we will have in the future um, really many players. They have to work together, not only on one market, also, especially in Europe, between different markets. What are the elements which NRA is responsible of the electronic communications sector should consider in order to facilitate cross-border applications? Yeah. Here I, I have uh, selected um, a few of our points we have um, uh, detected um, in during our work in a project. And um, you see there are um, uh, different open questions for spectrum and, spectrum and regulation. And the main um, critical issue is synchronization. Uh, we, we need a clock synchronization, we need alignment of uplink downlink patterns, and we have, of course, the impact of private networks. And this, especially in the, uh, in the areas close to the borders where our project is focused on, uh, is um, still with um, many open questions. And it means um, we need on this side, um, um, let's say, combined work to, to solve these issues. And um, we need also the help of the regulation uh, for different other questions like um, neighbor relations functions, especially for 5G. And um, then also the um, spectrum uh, allocation um, according seamless handover when you need uh, to fulfill um, requirements according lawful interception. That means um, for these issues, some of the functions are not legal right now and um, we have to change the law or we have to change the um, constellation how to work uh, interactively between different operators in, in a cross-border environment. And um, on the other side there are also some more research-oriented questions like um, cycling and positioning especially in these areas of, of uh, cross-borders between different operators. Thank you. I now move to Dr. Pagano, Director of Joint Leprosy, CNIT, um, ADS-PTS, Corealis Project. Good afternoon. ADS-PTS, ADS along with CNIT, are leading a deep digital revolution, seeking to increase the efficiency and safety of the activities taking place within the port of Livorno. Can you kindly describe the work that is being carried out by Corealis in this port, please? Yes, uh, let's uh, uh, define what is the uh, EDSP because it's an acronym. Very odd to be understood. It's uh, the Port Network Authority of the North Tyrrhenian Sea. It is uh, managing three ports in Tuscany. Uh, so we have teamed up as National Consortium of Telecommunications with the Port Authority in 2013, so eight years ago. And from 2015, uh, we uh, started a joint laboratory, the one I lead. So in my laboratory, there are people coming from the Port Authority and researchers. So why uh, did we team up? I don't know whether, are you familiar with the, uh, the jargon, the uh, port jargon, port communities. Uh, the, those communities are uh, including uh, ocean carriers, terminal operators, shippers, uh, freight forwarders, uh, and then also the uh, regulatory bodies like uh, the Coast Guard uh, or the Customs. So they have something in common because the scope of their activities is the same as the port. So the, uh, the target uh, by the Port Authority is that of uh, setting up a kind of standard uh, in terms of uh, how to decouple um, ICT services belonging to the infrastructure, so most notably 5G, to those belonging to the platform where the custodial of data is managed uh, from final user applications. So we have uh, designed uh, together with them uh, uh, target architecture and uh, we open this architecture to the digital single market. 
so that today we have uh, uh, many providers and uh, the authority is not anymore a body that uh, purchases something. It is uh, also a provider of uh, uh, innovation services. All what is uh, around uh, uh, passenger mobility and the e-freight, for instance, including uh, uh, e-navigation in port levels. So, including the uh, the maneuvering of the ship, huh? not not the deep sea sailing, but uh, when the ship is approaching the port. So, all these uh, uh, activities uh, led by the joint laboratory uh, have been also. Uh, are exploiting the, uh, to say, the innovation coming with 5G and most notably Corealis project. We have been part in uh, that together with other four ports in the European panorama. Uh, with that, we have, uh, uh, not to say, set up uh, a new 5G non-public network. We have, uh, I, I heard many times, uh, private networks, non-public network. So this is a uh, an experimental network set up by Ericsson uh, with the frequency bands by Telecom Italia and managed to, uh, how to say, uh, to provide services uh, for the port communities. So not general services. My opinion is that 5G is not for citizens, it's for industries only, unless you want to watch uh, uh, 4K movies, two 4K movies at a time you don't need 5G. Uh, you need uh, ultra reliable low latency communication if you want to have uh, if you want to have a very fast response from machines, uh, not not uh, to download movies. So that is uh, the, um, uh, the, the these are the news and uh, the prototype uh, is that of a yard management system. So one vertical application uh, in a fully decoupled uh, digital stack, as I said, distinguishing infrastructure from platform and from uh, applications. We have set up a, a vertical that is managing uh, uh, the activities in a yard. Uh, so, for instance, booking forklifts, uh, avoiding uh, accidents uh, in, in for workers that are moving around in a, in a berth. And uh, this has been, how to say, commissioned during the, the project. What are the key KPIs that must be developed, delivered by a 5G network in order to enable digital twins? Hey, you, you know, the, uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, uh, image of 5G. If you buy, I, I'm Italian, if you buy a pizza, you choose uh, to say a flavor. Instead of buying a single flavor, you have many slices. And uh, so you book uh, the slice you want. Uh, you you make use of the slice you want. So, uh, uh, if you uh, are thinking of the digital twin, uh, there can be services, uh, final user applications, when where you need you want to rely on many sources for enabling the the corner of the ITU triangle of massive machine type communication. In other cases, uh, if you want to let, how to say, the vessel uh, autonomously maneuver in the port waters, you want to have a reliable and low latency connection. So the key performance indicators uh, are many. It depends on the application. What can I say from the perspective uh, of the port authority is that we need a full connectivity. So, you know, the 5G network, uh, uh, the single, I would say, uh, uh, cell, uh, the single radio base station has a limited radius, especially if you want to uh, enable this uh, radio base station with uh, uh, millimeter waves. So we need a full coverage of the industrial plants. And uh, uh, this is the step, I would say, that has been uh, taken by the Port Authority to be committed in this kind of uh, uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, all the rest is uh, is OPEX, but there is some CAPEX uh, to be uh, invested. And uh, this is what the authority has done. We have approved in January, if I don't mistake, uh, the master plan, the digital master plan by the Port Authority, where we have actually 
uh, approved the full coverage in 5G of the industrial plants. So this is the ingredient that is, uh, to say, the common basis for every digital twin you want to invest on. From your experience with the de deployment of digital twins, how easy do you think it would be to switch between service providers? It depends on the model. If you adopt uh, uh, an open model, like the uh, port information stack that we adopted in Livorno, it will be easy. So you can switch from one mobile, mobile network operator, MNO or a virtual network operator as you like, to the other one. And uh, just because you want to borrow the frequencies, huh? this is something that uh, might be of interest uh, for Derek. So what does it mean to uh, uh, oblige or uh, uh, to let the MNOs uh, make available the frequencies uh, if they don't need them, huh? as it is written somewhere? Uh, so to let these, how to say, uh, um, chance uh, for uh, industrial plants to make use of the frequencies they need to set up non-public networks. This is very relevant. So if you want to switch from one service provider, and we have mobile network operators who are wonderful service providers as well, not only network connectivity providers, of course, uh, to the other, uh, if you adopt, I would say, an open architecture like uh, the one we have uh, standardized, and we try also to steer uh, the European standard setting organization in that regard, uh, to adopt such kind of model for uh, large scale infrastructures like those of seaports. Uh, in that case, uh, it will be easy to switch from one to the other. I don't know, did I answer you? Yes, yes, it's very <laughs> clear, thank you. What are your recommendations to Berk in terms of emerging trends and innovative concepts that will impact the telecommunications sector, Include, including yeah. 5G? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting, and, and I took some notes uh, on, about this because I looked at the, the 5G radar and uh, there are issues uh, uh, under the number of 6, 9, 23, and 24. In my opinion, they are impacted eh? uh, because, for instance, the creation of new wholesale markets uh, and I I think the future will be that of providing innovation services like vessel autonomous docking. Think of the future. Huh? 5G is bridging today to the future. Uh, then autonomous operation in berths and docks, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, I heard many times about uh, vehicle to everything, communication, booking systems. Uh, ports are examples, in my opinion, of new micro operators. Huh? Not, not that micro. Yeah, Probably Livorno will be a micro operator, but if you uh, think of Antwerp uh, so, um, uh, I think it's or Rotterdam, they will be very big operators. So we have to enable them to be, I would say, service providers in that regard and uh, to permit this, uh, uh, how do we call it, uh, wholesale markets, uh, wholesale markets. And then, second, not I'm okay. Second, as I said, let's... if if there is an agreement on the current on so, the current things, then may I ask uh, non speakers to mute their their connection, please. Thank you. Apologies for that. Can no you problem. please <laughs> continue? Uh, then there is another issue that is labeled as nine quality of service requirements of pan European services. This is very, very important if you deal with the international shipping. Eh? Ocean carriers want to rely on the same quality of service while entering ports of different countries. So we, we need to standardize and, de and define, properly define, the quality of service delivered by a 5G network. It's not, how to say, just that of uh, pointing the, how to say, the corner in a triangle. We have to be very accurate in it. Because eh? otherwise there will be an autonomous ship entering the port of Livorno, behave safely, and uh, in another country with, uh, how to say, lower level of quality of service, of grade of service by the 5G network, it will be having an accident. Okay, so this is very important. Sustainability. 
this is uh, something that it is not how to say under the gut feeling the prompt the gut feeling of everybody looking at 5g sustainability but it is the case we have done a calculation with the help of ericsson uh, rossella gardone is uh, is uh, this uh, this person who actually have, uh, has carried on this uh, this uh, study uh, that uh, if we invest on 5g we will have uh, a reduction in the carbon footprint uh, produced by the port huh? because uh, the the, uh, the vessels will uh, will be able to say berted for less time the activities will be more more efficient and so pollution will be reduced and the carbon footprint will be reduced so sustainability and 5g they go into the same direction and finally uh satcom uh, it is something that we don't mention the, that often in my opinion if you want to uh, consider for instance uh, services delivered to the vessels to the uh, so-called maritime autonomous service ships and this is under the imo jargon uh, the uh, autonomous vessels uh, you have to uh, provide how to say a, 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 a very appropriate uh, description of the end of uh, procedures uh, to uh, uh, move from the satellite to the 5g terrestrial networks these are quite relevant we have to study upon this topic that's it i shut up thank you dr pagano um thank you as well for going through the Berg 5g radar and mapping um and making your recommendation based on that i now move to You're mr welcome. I will now move to Mr. Neira, principal consultant at Exxon Partners Group. From your experience, how is the technical development of 5G and its adoption going to drive innovation across the various industries in Europe? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question and, and for the invitation to this panel. Uh, as my colleagues today have anticipated before, 5G is bringing a, a number of technical enhancements in, in comparison with previous generations. Uh, we can talk about bandwidth, latency, reliability, efficiency, and so on. So it is very well known uh, that these improvements will enable the evolution of many services and applications uh, across multiple industries, right? So, and actually many of these examples have been uh, widely discussed today in this workshop. Um, what I can say is that based on the extensive research and many interviews uh, with companies deploying uh, 5G applications across Europe, uh, I can safely say that the technical development of 5G and its adoption will progress in a staged manner. So as with uh, previous generations, 5G will definitely coexist with and complement existing and new technologies over the years. Uh, with more complex and impactful capabilities being, re being realized over, over the long term. So I believe, all in all, that there will be uh, three major uh, stages surrounding the, the implementation of, of 5G. Um, starting with the current situation, uh, 5G will begin to make an impact in existing industries and business models, mainly by enhancing uh, current operations and services. So this is actually happening now uh, and will be with us mainly in the next one, two years uh, with some use cases such as yeah, fixed wireless, fixed wireless access or, or smart city applications. Then this, this first stage will be, will be then followed by a stage of you know, increasing 5G capability and, and greater availability, uh, which will cater for the emergence of more advanced 5G applications. So this is, in my view, likely to, to take another two, three years uh, with uh, some use cases, uh, for instance, collaborative gaming or uh, interactive live events. No? And uh, finally, the third stage, uh, uh, the full realization of 5G, uh, which will up in the most complex use cases that will be made full utilization of 5G technologies uh, through widely deployed networks. So this is, uh, in my view, likely to happen in a, in a five-year time frame uh, with essentially much more complex and, and innovative cases like, uh, you know, remote surgery or potentially highly autonomous vehicles. 
It is very well known that SMEs and startups are likely to play an important role in driving innovation within the European 5G ecosystem. From your experience, which are the main barriers or limitations that these companies face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, so first of all, yeah, you are very right about the fact that uh, SMEs, small and medium enterprises, are already becoming one of the key players in, in driving innovation in Europe. And this is mainly uh, driven by two angles. One, it's defining the technology to make 5G networks viable. Uh, that's one point. And the second one is developing applications and, and business cases that uh, capture the benefits of 5G across Europe. Uh, it is also a reality that these companies face uh, a wide range of barriers when they aim to bring innovation in this market. So, I mean, although there are many, I'd like to high, highlight two of them that in my view represent the main bottlenecks of, of these companies. So first, and I believe the most important one, it's the access to finance. So at Action Partners Group, the, the consultancy firm that I represent today, uh, we provided support recently to the European Investment Bank and the European Commission in the elaboration of a study, which actually was published a couple of months ago that aims to analyze the readiness of Europe to finance large-scale innovation uh, transition uh, that is coming with time. And this study essentially highlighted that European companies developing 5G applications are facing significant public and private uh, financing bottlenecks. And this is uh, mainly explained by the fact that currently uh, the majority of these companies are at a very early stage of development, with most of them depending on public instruments and, and equity investments, generally either from angel investors or even venture capital firms. However, uh, the perceived high risk profile of these businesses is a key constraint that limits the mobilization of capital. So these funding constraints uh, represent a, a very big challenge for the evolution of 5G innovation in Europe. And the second barrier that I'd like to highlight today, which is actually well connected to the, to the first one, the access to finance, is the fragmentation of the demand and supply of 5G across Europe. So it is sad to say that the, the differences across EU member states in, in several topics, for instance, spectrum allocations, uh, connectivity, readiness, and so on, uh, result in a very fragmented 5G landscape with regards to, to international operations. So um, this creates actually many issues for companies that are trying to, to reach scale across Europe. Um, so at the end of the day, actually this, this fragmentation is, uh, is limiting much the commercial expansion of companies across the different territories. And, and indeed requires incremental cost to manage these cross-country differences. So as a consequence, this, this situation, this fragmented market, uh, places uh, the European Union companies uh, at, a, at a disadvantage in comparison to uh, other companies operating in, in, in other innovation hubs like, like uh, United States or, or China. How can European institutions help address these barriers and flourish a 5G-based innovation ecosystem? Well, uh, for the first barrier uh, that I was mentioning before, the access to finance, uh, I think it's clear that the mobilization of both public and private resources uh, becomes a key lever to be used for an acceleration of, of, 5G, of 5G innovation in Europe. So actually, I believe there's, there's a strong case for strategic uh, and public investments to be made available into the 5G ecosystem uh, with a view at the end of the day to uh, covering the, identifi the identified gap, uh, funding gap in Europe. So using public money, uh, European institutions can finance uh, funds and investments in areas that can have the greatest overall impact on the on the European 5G economy. And actually, this public capital can be used not only to directly fund uh, European research and development and SMEs, 
but also, and very importantly, to throw private money into 5G as well, uh, leveraging resources such as venture capital, angel investors, and, and, and even corporate venture capital from the broader industry. So, um, if these financial challenges are not addressed, uh, I'm afraid that Europe runs the risk of being left behind in the race for uh, 5G leadership, at least in comparison to other uh, important regions like uh, US or, or China. And, and for the second barrier, uh, I think all people here would agree that it's, it's essential to, to seek active support from European institutions to promote uh, further homogeneity across Europe. In my view, the most important area is on the public policy and, and, regula and regulation side. Uh, it's true that Europe has taken significant steps towards creating a, a unified Europe from a digital perspective, uh, the so-called digital single market. Uh, but I believe there's still, there is still room for strengthening existing regulations and policies. So in this context, I believe that areas such as uh, rights of way or, or infrastructure sharing regulations are points where homogeneous policies can go a long way towards you know, fostering a 5G innovation ecosystem. And finally, since uh, innovative use cases will make an impact across multiple industries at the same time, uh, I believe it becomes crucial to ensure a true cross-sectorial policy and regulations. And needless to say, these, these policies must be uh, future-oriented and, and have to embrace all the relevant stakeholders within, within this uh, ecosystem. I think you have already touched upon this, but uh, mm -hmm. what, within, in which areas do you believe that BRAC could make a bigger impact in the shorter and medium term? Yeah, yeah, I believe that you know, all in all, the rate at which 5G innovation will proliferate in Europe will ultimately depend on, on several factors. No? First is the availability of the technology supporting 5G capabilities. So this is currently underway. Uh, and new technical developments will be happening in a, in a staged manner, as, as I mentioned earlier. Another factor is the capacity of companies to develop new use cases and demand for their adoption. No? Here, uh, as I mentioned before, the financing ecosystem needs to be, uh, needs to be solved. And finally, uh, the rollout of, of 5G networks that will allow the realization of new business models. No? So, there's no way to bring innovation if there's no infrastructure behind. So in this point is where I believe BEREC should play an, an important role. So in my view, the, BEREC, the focus of BEREC, uh, at least in the short term, should be uh, to ensure that the deployment of 5G networks across Europe happens rapidly and in an homogeneous manner. So in my view, the most important areas where, where efforts should be put at this time uh, are, first of all, promote that spectrum allocations occur in a timely manner and with the homogeneity across Europe, then facilitate the deployment of, of sites and small cells in, and the associated backhaul that, that these sites need, and finally, foster commercial infrastructure sharing agreements. So these three areas are, in my view, the most um, important uh, or priority areas that the BEREC should look into of course, in cooperation with, with all relevant stakeholders. Thank you, Mr. Neira. Um, I'm looking at the chat and it doesn't seem like there are questions directed to our panelists. Um, I'm not sure if anyone would like to make some final remarks. In that case, I would like to first and foremost thank you for participating in this uh, workshop and for providing and sharing with us your experience and expertise. We can see that a lot of progress has been made, especially thanks to bringing together consortia representing different entities, but there's still a lot to be done. And uh, the pace of innovation can't actually be anticipated. It can be, in a way, at this date in time, monitored. Monitored to observe the interaction between 
innovators, existing traditional key stakeholders, and also new players such as the Verticals. So thank you all for your time and for, for participating in this workshop. Um, thank you. <laughs>